welcome everybody. Um, welcome to the February edition of the Legislative Branch Capacity Working Group. Can you guys hear me or do I need this weird thing? I'm just going to shout at you then. February edition, we're talking about budget process as you, I hope you guys are all aware. Hopefully this is not the case where you show up the first day of class and it's not the one you signed up for. So budget process, welcome. Today, um, the Leg I'm Casey Burgett, a governance fellow with the R Street Institute, and sitting beside me is Lee Drutman, senior fellow of the New American Foundation. And hopefully you guys are aware that uh, the, this working group is a, the brainchild of my boss, Kevin Kosar, on the end there, and Lee trying to get smart people in the same room together to talk about how to make Congress work just a little bit better. And today's topic, budget process, is the biggest, baddest of them all. So thanks for being here. We have two heavy, heavy hitters on budget process here today. Both have a really extensive uh, authors, testifiers in front of Congress. Maya was here. I'll introduce them in a second, but I want to get to what we hope this, this meeting is about. If you've been to ledge branch meetings before, this one I'm, I'm hoping is taking, takes more of an open discussion format. We do have guest speakers. Uh, they are going to give you five to ten minutes of their opening thoughts on the budget process, their prospects for reform, what they advocate for. But after that, we have no agenda. It's going to be up to you to ask questions, to provide your own expertise. There is a tremendous amount of brain power in this room, and we want to take advantage of all of it. It strikes me that right now, I was thinking on the way over here, that this is a perfect time to have this budget process uh, discussion. At one point or another, I bet all the money in my pocket that every one of us has said that the budget process, as currently constituted, is broken. Uh, the opportunities for reform are from all over the political spectrum, and so we want to talk about those today. So, do you have anything to add, Lee, about I'm excited to hear it. <laughs> Without let's, further let's ado, started. cool. I'm going to introduce our two guest speakers. Right. The first is Philip Joyce professor and senior associate dean at the University of Maryland, Go Terps. He has, is an extensive author on the Congressional Budget Process, the Congressional Budget Office, of which you've served, is that right? And also, uh, if I read your bio correctly, he has served at the state level in Illinois' Bureau of the Budget. So correct. there's an interesting perspective there that we should explore a little bit about the state level. Yes. And second, next to, on my left, is Maya McGinnis, the president of the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget. Uh, a, another prolific author in all formats and one of the most frequent congressional testifiers I've ever seen in my entire life. She was up here two weeks ago in front of the Senate Homeland mm -hmm. Security Subcommittee talking about the need for congressional budget process reform and, and the likelihoods of, of that happening. So without further ado, we're going to start with Philip and his thoughts, move to Maya, and then again, it's going to be open, so be ready to talk to these experts. Thanks. All right. Um, thanks a lot, Casey, uh, and thank you all for coming. You didn't know, perhaps, that it's a nice day. That's why you're here. Right. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm very impressed that people will come out, uh, even though there's a free lunch, to, uh, to talk about the budget process. Um, what I want to do, and you know, I don't know whether there'll be many insights from the state level. I was actually in the Illinois Budget Office during the golden age of Illinois budgeting when there was a budget. Uh, uh, as you might know, Illinois just went uh, you know, a year and a half or so maybe without a budget, which is, you know, a sort of a brand new thing at the, at the state level. We thought only California did that. Um, so what I want to do, and I don't want to take more than, uh, certainly more than 10 minutes, hopefully less than 10 minutes, is to talk about three things. Uh, first, uh, what did the Congress and the President, uh, although he was dragged a little kicking and screaming, I uh, think they were doing in 1974 when they created the last budget process reform. Second, uh, what do we know about how it has worked? Uh, Cliff Notes version, not quite as expected. Uh, and then third, uh, to talk a little bit about uh, what the main ideas are that are out there for reforming the budget process, and I am going to resist in this sort of segment uh, giving you any opinions about what I think about any of those as opposed to just sort of cataloging them and then we can have a discussion about pros and cons in the more sort of open discussion. So first, just to talk about the last major budget reform, which is obviously the 1974 Congressional Budget and Empowerment Control Act, 
Uh, why did the Congress do that? Uh, the first reason was to strengthen the Congress vis-a-vis uh, -vis the President. There was a notion that the President had gotten too powerful. Uh, some of you remember, as my students do not, uh, who the President was in 1974, uh, at least in the early part of 1974, and so this was in part a reaction to uh, President Nixon and the view of some of his excesses. Uh, the second reason was to make the Congress more responsible for aggregates in the budget uh, by creating the budget committees and the budget resolution. And the third was to provide the Congress with uh, an increased analytical capacity, and that was not only in the budget committees, but also probably primarily uh, with the creation of, of CBO. Uh, sort of fourth point, uh, which many of you may know, but some of you may not, is that the, the other thing that they did was they actually changed the uh, fiscal year from uh, starting on July 1st to starting on October 1st, and that was because they couldn't ever get the budget done by July 1st. So uh, whatever the problem was, adding three months didn't seem to uh, solve the problem. Um, now, I, I think it's important to keep in mind that the budget process, this budget process, did not attempt to promote any specific goal for budgeting, no, no specific sort of goal for fiscal discipline. It didn't say the budget needed to be balanced. It didn't say the debt, you know, could only be a certain percentage of GDP. But later on, starting in 1970, or 1985, rather, with the uh, Graham-Rudman-Hollings legislation and then continuing on all the way up to the Budget Control Act, we've actually tried to use the budget process to try to promote uh, fiscal discipline. <clears throat> so second sort of broad um, discussion uh, about you know, how it has worked. So in terms of this sort of last issue of fiscal discipline, so here's my conclusion on the budget process and fiscal discipline, is that the budget process has both promoted fiscal discipline and promoted fiscal irresponsibility. So that's helpful. What that means is that it's promoted fiscal discipline when the Congress wanted to engage in fiscal discipline, which means uh, 1990, 1993, to a lesser extent 1997. But it has also, if the Congress wanted to do things that were not sort of fiscally disciplined, and I think we have some recent examples of that, uh, they have done that. And what both of those have in common is reconciliation. That is, that reconciliation has made it easier to do things that you want to do, whether those things are disciplined or not. Um, the second sort of broad uh, conclusion about the budget process is that I think our history sort of demonstrates that the budget process is not good at forcing people to do things that they don't want to do. Uh, like reducing the deficit, for example, but it is good at enforcing uh, agreements that have already been made, uh, as long as there's a consensus. I think you know that's the sort of story behind pay-as-you-go. Pay-as-you-go didn't cause anything to happen, but it enforced sort of discipline after the fact. In fact, I think we have lots of evidence that things like triggers and sequestration do not work as a mechanism to make people do things. Um, there is an argument uh, that making the Congress more powerful after 1974 actually made fiscal discipline less likely sort of in total because it diffused responsibility. That is, it, re it removed the president from being sort of the person who was solely viewed as responsible for aggregates and it created a situation where there could be lots of finger pointing about sort of who was to blame for whatever it was that was happening. Um, a, a further nuance to this argument that's been made by some, uh, including uh, Lou Fisher, who used to be at, uh, at CRS, is that Congress is actually not very good at aggregates. Um, it's good at dealing uh, with the budget in piecemeal, but not sort of in total. Uh, <clears throat> when you think about <coughs> excuse me, the budget resolution, which was supposed to be what made us sort of look at aggregates, I think we'd have to conclude in retrospect that it's been a failure in terms of routine priority setting, in large part because it's a hit and miss proposition. About half the time in the last 20 years, we haven't uh, had a budget resolution. And sometimes when we have a budget resolution, it's just to allow the Congress to do things uh, without having to get any support from the minority, which has happened in the last few years with both the Affordable Care Act and also with uh, the recent tax cut. In terms of, uh, of CBO uh, and sort of analytical capacity for the Congress, I think that's actually been a great success. And I think I would say that even if I didn't used to work at, at CBO. Uh, I am actually the author of the best book ever written as a history of CBO because it's the only book ever written as a, as a history of CBO. But in the process of researching that, I frankly became even uh, more uh, 
an, an admirer of what CBO has been able to do just in terms of sort of creating a space for honest numbers. Um, and then finally, uh, if, we, if we want to ask the question uh, about uh, the budget process in terms of the sort of did it improve timeliness, I think that everybody knows that the answer to that is no, and I think the main sort of exhibit here has to do with the appropriations process. The appropriations process, you know, is basically a failure in the sense that uh, it, it does not actually perform its most basic responsibility, which is providing a timely and predictable flow of funds. So, uh, in just a few minutes that I have left, um, just sort of thinking about budget reform, I will say there are lots of ideas out there for reforming the budget process. A lot of them are not new. Uh, when I was at CBO for five years in the early 1990s, it was my job to keep track of budget process reform ideas because the director might be called to testify on them at any moment. I was also detailed uh, to the 1993 Joint Committee on the Organization of Congress, which was the last effort to reform the congressional committee process. Uh, and uh, you know that committee's conclusion about the budget process, that is the only thing they could agree on, was that we should have a biennial budget process, which either means that that's the best idea that anybody has had, or it means that they agreed on it because they thought it, it in an effect, would not actually change very much, and therefore it was non-controversial. So I want to sort of divide the, the kinds of reforms that people talk about with respect to the budget process into six categories. The first is making people do things they don't want to do. Uh, trigger, sequestration, balanced budget amendments, they're all sort of in this category. Uh, and I've already sort of told you what I think of that. Um, or what our, hi what our history sort of shows us. The second is what I would call information-based reforms. Uh, that is, uh, if we have more information on, for example, the long-term effects of policies in the President's budget or the budget resolution, if we were more transparent about the effects of, uh, of legislation, then perhaps that would be beneficial. Uh, a third is um, kind of reform of budget concepts, which I would also sort of define as a reform in the way things kind of appear to cost in the budget. So that the sort of starting point for this was credit reform in 1990, but there are other places like pension insurance, deposit insurance, flood insurance, where you could imagine that the budget could send better signals on the cost of uh, a particular kinds of, of policies. And, and the sort of broadest suggestion here uh, has been that we actually need uh, a new commission on uh, budget concepts. Uh, you know, some of you may know that in 1967 there was actually something called the President's Commission on Budget Concepts, which created a lot of the sort of rules about how you score things in the budget, for example. Uh, some people have suggested that we might want to have another one. Uh, the fourth is uh, committee reform, uh, and this is everything from strengthening the budget committees uh, to trying to, in some way, better force trade offs among policies to be. Uh, <coughs> to be considered. Uh, for example, Steve Redburn, who's in the room, and his colleague Paul Posner have written about portfolio budgeting, which is essentially trying to take all the policies that would affect a particular policy area, whether they're tax expenditures or mandatory spending or discretionary spending, and sort of think about them together. Um, the, another sort of piece of this, of course, is uh, that has been suggested by some people is uh, is combining the appropriations and authorizing committees, which uh, the authorizing and appropriations committees are not in favor of, by the way. Um, the uh, the fifth is uh, making the budget process more timely and predictable. I think that biennial budgeting sort of fits in there in terms of its goal. Uh, I think that there are questions about whether it might work or not, but also other things that would encourage more timely actions, especially on appropriations, things like automatic continuing resolutions or no continuing resolutions being permitted <laughs> at all. And then finally, um, reforms that would affect the balance of power between the branches, giving a line item veto to the president, uh, making the budget resolution signed by the president. Almost all the reforms I have seen that are about the balance of power between the branches would give more power to the president and take power uh, away from the Congress as opposed to the other way around. So as I, as I note, I, I have opinions about all of these, but I will not share any that I have not already shared, and I will uh, just sort of wait for the Q&A and see what people want to talk about. But thank you.
Oops. Okay, thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, that was great. I, I broke my kinds of different budget process reforms into three categories, but I already like Phil's six categories better. For, so I'm going to pretty much uh, associate myself with all of his comments, including how great CBO is. We'll, we'll have to do a little bit on like why the importance of CBO and impartial scorekeeping and information from there. Um, so I think this is a great discussion to have today because we're about to have this commission, whether people think it's going to be successful or not, but on budget process reform. And given that, for the most part, I think Congress is unlikely to do anything at all this year, certainly on the fiscal front, having something that they have to report on and come up with some ideas, uh, I was just saying to Phil ahead of time, like perhaps inadvertently they'll stumble onto something that actually people can agree on and is meaningful. And in a moment where it seems like it's virtually impossible to get anything done and our organization's whole focus is on big fiscal overhauls, that's clearly not going anywhere. It seems like it's a really good time for incremental changes that people don't necessarily think are going to upend the entire process or change the political dynamic, but may bring people together who haven't worked together before and create a tiny win. So I'm keeping my fingers crossed that we can really turn that into something. Um, and people almost always say how budget process isn't really the problem, and that is absolutely true, that there is nothing budget process will fix that couldn't be fixed without it, and it will be able to fix without, it won't be able to fix any of those things without the underlying political will uh, to get there in the first place. But the fiscal situation is so bad, something is going to have to change. Uh, there will be changes made. It's just a question of whether they'll happen on their own anytime soon or whether they're going to happen in the long run because they're forced upon us. Um, and budget process might play a tiny, tiny role in all of that. So I thought I would just go over what I think the problems are in budgeting and sort of the, like I said, my not as elegant grouping of different kinds of reforms and then we'd open it up and think through what some of the most interesting reforms probably could be. Um, so I had just written down like the list of shortcomings I think in the budget process and I probably missed a bunch of them, but I would say transparency, the lack of transparency in the budget in so many ways from accounting to what the actual numbers are. Baselines, I still feel like I've spent more hours in my life trying to reconstruct baselines and figure out why everybody's is different and figure out where the tricks are being played instead of just having numbers be numbers. Um, all the way to the fact that we do tons of spending in the budget through the tax code, tax expenditures, which are treated so differently from spending but really are so similar in so many ways. Um, certainly accountability, which I think is shown by the many, many deadlines that are missed, but I was really interested because I think I agree wholeheartedly that 1974 actually, un which I think is a good budget process reform uh, for the most part, undid a lot of the un accountability because when it's so easy to just say it's somebody else's fault, there is no one place where the accountability resides. So whether it's missing a deadline or the terrible fiscal outcomes that we have as a, a country overall, um, I think that's a big problem. The focus on the short term, that's become a bigger and bigger issue, I think. Um, as the bigger problems in the budget now, now unfortunately the uh, long term is becoming the more immediate term, but for the past 10 years or so where folks have been worried about the long term unsustainability of the fiscal situation, meaning that our debt is growing faster than our overall economy, but it hasn't been a problem about the deficit this year per se, um, there's very little in the budget process that forces or even rewards thinking about how to improve the long term fiscal trajectory or um, imbalances within the budget. So that certainly is a problem that is, has become a much bigger problem with the aging of the population because we have a number of intergenerational programs, Social Security and Medicare, and as the baby boomers going towards retirement have become a bigger issue, that long-term problem has become bigger. Fourth, I would say the issue of gimmicks. Uh, the number of gimmicks, and I think we all know this, anytime you put forth budget rules, you make rules, as soon as you've made the rules, the other people's job, the people's job is to figure out how to break them and get around them. And we're always issuing, the committee's always issuing reports on budget gimmicks, and we're <coughs> terrified to do it because we're, we're about to do a big one next week. We're always afraid that it's basically writing the bomb maker's manual, right? Like, here's all the gimmicks. Maybe you didn't think of it. You could just try this one. Um, but the gimmicks have become really undermining the credibility of the overall process, I think. Like, any time you hear the word Roth IRA, know that we're no longer talking about an interesting creative type of vehicle to help with savings. We're talking about manipulating the timing of the budget process. So that's a problem when things become, gimmicks become so routinely used. Um, 
automatic pilot, so much of our energy and the budget process focuses on the appropriations of the third of the budget that's discretionary, misses completely the mandatory spending, which has grown to two-thirds of the budget, and it's where the biggest problem lies. But I actually think it's bigger than two-thirds of the budget. It also misses oversight of tax expenditures. So tax expenditures, which um, if we had done tax reform the way I would have liked to, where we broadened the base and got rid of a lot of the tax breaks, would not be as big as an issue as it is but we didn't do it that way. So we still have well, well over a trillion dollars in tax breaks per year. Those programs really are akin to spending, but just like a lot of parts of the budget, they get no oversight, no evaluation, very little awareness of all the redundancy, repetitiveness, overlap in it. But this, so much of the budget, there's no scrutiny. And I've heard members of Congress routinely say, like, well, we don't even have a say in those big mandatory spending programs. Well, of course they do. That's what their laws, the laws guide those programs. But there's a complete kind of unawareness that those programs need to be evaluated and make sure that those are reflecting the priorities of the country. And then finally, the fiscal outcomes. Uh, there's just no, you can't read a CBO report without realizing what a bad fiscal situation we have right now. The debt relative to the economy is twice the historical average in this country, and it's twice where we were when we went into the recession of 2008. The reason you don't want to have that is because we're in all likelihood much closer to the next recession than the previous recession. You want to have the fiscal flexibility for whatever kinds of stimulus people think is necessary to work with monetary policy. When your debt is twice where it was before, you definitely do not have the same amount of fiscal space as we once did. So this is a, a huge problem in terms of it has big effects on the economy. The fastest growing part of the budget is the interest payments. But it also means when we have the next downturn, we'll have much less of an ability to respond to it. And it's not just where we are with the debt relative to the economy today that's so problematic. It's the fact that, fact that we were already on track to borrow another $10 trillion, doing nothing over the next 10 years. But the tax cut and the new spending deal just made that much worse. So we're more moving up towards 12 to $14 trillion. Um, so the outcomes are bad. It has nothing to do with the size of government. People can want smaller government. People can want larger government. But debt financing should be something that's consi consistent with where you are in the economic cycle, not just reflective of not wanting to pay for things. But there's no constraints on that. So the three uh, ways that I was looking at the different kinds of reforms are the first bucket would basically be incremental reforms. And when we were first talking about having this discussion, we were just going to focus more on biennial budgeting. Um, and that is, that's one of the things I would put into incremental reforms, along with automatic CRs, or that was interesting, an idea of no CRs. Um, I guess I put that in my second bucket, which is stronger incentives to avoid things. But biennial budgeting, C auto CRs, joint budget resolution, single changes that could help nudge the budget uh, process into a more constructive way where things ran more smoothly. They're incremental, which doesn't mean they're easy at all. Biennial budgeting may be the easiest. It's one that I'm lukewarm to positive on, primarily less because of the substance and more because there's a number of people who support it. There are also a lot of people who oppose it strongly. But I would like to see us get something done, again, to just start moving on things. So biennial budgeting may be that kind of low-hanging fruit piece that you put in because a lot of members think that they will get a lot more done and spend more time on evaluation. <coughs> Um, I'm probably biased in thinking it won't be that effective because I think it depends where you sit on the spectrum of procrastination. <laughs> I'm a huge procrastinator, so I have little faith it will change everything dramatically. Um, but I do think the political process may not be able to handle much more than those incremental kinds of reforms, so I think they're worth, think worth thinking about. Um, second area is improving incentives or uh, enforcement mechanisms. So there are things like no budget, no pay, which I'm not particularly a fan of because I think it's just too gimmicky, but I like the idea. I like the idea, and I also don't like the idea of saying to members that some of you can't, that you can't get paid when some members are, have, don't really need to get paid and others do. It just seems like it won't work as well. Um, but I do like the same kind of ideas of no recess. I do like the ideas of that you can't consider other legislation until you've passed a budget. So some things that are slightly less gimmicky but more punitive. Um, <coughs> I, I, what I really like um, are mechanisms that are supposed to keep you on track. Pay as you go is probably the best example of something that I think is really important. I'm probably one of the only few people who's ever helped hold a pay-go pep rally. This was one of the sadder events that I've ever hosted. <laughs> but, um, 
I just think the simple notions of that, if you're going to cut taxes or you're going to increase spending, you need to figure out how to offset the costs. Not only is it a good rule to make us not make the fiscal situation worse, it's what budgeting is. Budgeting is supposed to be, the country is supposed to pick national priorities, as divided as we all are. It does seem to me that like some national objectives is probably one of the easier places that people could find common ground. And then you figure out the different ways, the different kinds of policies that you need to achieve them. Sometimes it's government, sometimes it's not. There are lots of fights about that, but if you have these shared goals, it's a good starting point. Then you evaluate the different ways to achieve them, then you evaluate the cost, and then you figure out how you would finance them. So that's how budgeting is supposed to work. Pay as you go, I really think is helpful because it basically says, is this tax cut worth it? Is this new entitlement program worth it? Is this increase in the spending caps worth it? If you think about how much it would cost, that's a helpful way to determine whether it's worth it. And if you do that as a country, that's how you budget. So I like PAYGO a lot. I get um, disheartened that we waive PAYGO and people barely even notice. So I do think about different enforcement mechanisms being a really important part about strengthening uh, the overall process. And then finally, um, just a major budget process overhaul, which I kind of, I'll editorialize a little bit more in Phil, but I, I'm in favor of, not because it's the budget process that's the problem, but because things are so broken that I feel like we need a big solution. That if we just do something like biennial budgeting, we know it's not gonna change anything dramatically. We have gotten to the point of the way that we budget in this country, and, and it's so obvious, right? If you're actually shutting down the government because you can't agree, if you're running the biggest economy in the world with no budget in place, you don't have to make the case how broken things are. But I do think we need kind of a massive overhaul. Um, and I'm really interested in, in a bunch of ideas for bigger structural changes, things that would look at making sure that we budget for the entire budget so that you also look at mandatory spending and tax expenditures in your budgeting process in one way or another things that would look at the long-term health of the country. I think, um, when I was just talking about PAYGO, I think another huge disconnect in the budget is that we've made promises that down the road spending will be 28% of GDP. And yet, we're only willing to tax ourselves at 17% of GDP. <coughs> That's a disconnect. So I've always thought about, like, what about a long-term PAYGO, where you can't make more promises for the future than you're willing to pay in revenues today. And so revenues would automatically have to go up, or long-term promises would have to go down. But some kinds of mechanisms that would help equalize our promises in the future, which are free in one way today to today's Congresses, with our willingness to finance things. Um, we came out with a big process recommendation a number of years ago, which would have had debt targets, and those are goals that you would get the debt back down to a sustainable level. Uh, we, I should say, Steve, who did all the work. Um, and how you'd figure out how you put those debt targets in place, you have an agreement on them, and you put multi-year budgets in place that would achieve those debt targets with budgetary <coughs> triggers, meaning automatic changes that would get you there if they're not enacted. That's the heavy list that's not going to work right now, but would really be good and helpful in getting this country back into a sustainable fiscal situation. Um, but it is, I also agree with that budget process either falls into the forcing, forcing you to do something, or enforcing. Uh, keeping you on track with something you've always de already decided to do. Forcing doesn't really work unless, unless members of Congress want it to work. If they say, like, which they do behind closed doors a lot, please force us to do this thing, then maybe the moment would be right to put in forth the kind of those triggers. We saw with budgetary sequester recently that whenever, there's two kinds of triggers, good ones and bad ones. Policies that are so bad you'd never want them to hit, so you put them there so you'd avoid them, and policies that would actually make sense as default policies. The sequester was a policy that was so bad that we were never going to let it hit. It hit. Turns out we would rather not make any hard choices than let bad policies hit. So we've learned a lesson right now, which I think triggers which are really bad policies are an unwise choice for this moment. If you want to put a trigger in place, it should be a policy that actually makes sense. Um, so <coughs> gradual automatic tax increases on the right base uh, spending reductions on the right base, those would be more sensible if you're going to put in place those kinds of triggers. But so I do think that the enforcing mechanisms, things that would keep any budget deal on track, are much more likely to succeed. And I think it, just an example of that is a lot of people like the budget ba balance budget amendment. A lot of people like it. And we don't have a position on it organizationally. But the one thing that I always say when somebody supports BBA is like, I'm delighted to talk to you about that as soon as you tell me 
how you would get to the balanced budget. <laughs> because it is not okay to kind of put in place a rule that you couldn't even live by. We've actually seen that in the past years with a lot of budgets that were put in place and then policies in the next year that completely ignored those budgets. So what you don't want to do is put grandiose sounding budget process reforms that replace your willingness to actually pick those policies. You want the reforms that would help you choose between the policies. So those are my thoughts. Looking forward to our discussion. I think we should start by asking Phil his opinions of all of this that he put forward. <laughs> Do you want to say anything? <laughs> Do I want, no, I don't want to give my opinion of everything. I, I, will just, I will just add on Maya's last point that I believe the sort of high watermark for the balanced budget amendment, I think, was 1995 when it came within one vote of getting the yeah. two-thirds in the Senate. The two leading proponents in the Senate were Phil Graham and Paul Simon. Uh, Phil Graham was a very conservative senator from Texas. Paul Simon was a very liberal senator from Illinois. Paul Simon believed if you had a balanced budget amendment to the Constitution, it would require you to raise the level of revenues to the level of spending. Senator Graham believed it would, it would uh, lower the level of uh, of spending to the level of revenues. So that, you know, is a point, you know, there they both are, were arm in arm agreeing on a balanced budget amendment. They could not possibly have agreed on how to get there. Okay. May, may I just ask a question before we go to the audience, which is um, realizing that the budget process, as it's played out recently, is such a fantastic mess. Can you clarify where we are in the process for next fiscal year, the one that starts October 1? Are we going to a resolution? Are we going to see appropriations? Are we in what about caps that are in statute and all that? Well, uh, we're not going to see anything, unfortunately, but we haven't seen, experienced that yet, so I'll try to be more optimistic. Mm -hmm. So where we are is we've had the President's budget. The President's budget has been released. On paper, it has some numbers that get you to a reasonable fiscal objective, I think, for the time period. However, it gets you there with policies that are either massively overstated or economic growth assumptions that are, are magical in their thinking. So uh, the, the actual likely policies, it has about $4 trillion in savings. The real policy savings, if you count huge cuts in uh, NDD, which I don't think you're going to have, given the budget deal we just had shows there's no appetite for that, it's slightly above a trillion in savings. If you don't count that, or it's about one and a half trillion in savings, if you don't count that, there's probably about 500 billion savings overall. And keep in mind, if somebody wants to reach the reach balance, which I don't think is the right fiscal goal because I think it's too aggressive, I wish it were a possibility, I'd like to see a budget balance goal of over a budget, over a economic cycle you have balance, sometimes surpluses, sometimes deficits. We're too far in the hole for that to happen. But to get to balance, you need about six trillion in savings. So this budget realistically has about 500 billion. So uh, that's just the start of the process. The next part, of course, is that the House and the Senate but will have to come forward with their budget resolutions. I don't know where it breaks down, but it breaks down. Um, yeah. My guess is the House will get something done. The Senate will decide not to. Um, and I think it's an incredible abdication of responsibility. I just I think it's it's shocking that we are completely willing to say, let's go forward without a budget. And a big piece of this is because we just had that massive spending deal, which was incredibly fiscally irresponsible. Um, more spending than many many of the requests even were for. I mean, the spending numbers are incredible. For instance, in defense, how much more was, was allocated for defense than the Defense Department wanted, um, and that many people in the past years had, had shown it to be the right amount, or how much they had requested. Um, but it was, not offset and the whole purpose of the sequester was let's not take this out on discretionary spending which isn't a problem in the budget but let's look for new revenues or mandatory savings they gave up on the entire notion of the offsets uh for almost all of it other than health care but i think that that frees them certainly there's you're not sticking with any budget caps the sequester is gone they've blown through back all of that savings um and I, they're not going to go re relitigate that this year and they're not going to go through the appropriations process in any meaningful way and I would just make my plug, because I, I still not have recovered from how irresponsible this tax bill was, uh, which really was stunningly irresponsible. But what we see is, if you let yourself off the hook to offset the cost for something like a big tax cut, and you make up kind of numbers about how it's going to pay for itself or grow the economy so much that it won't add to the debt when they're clearly, clearly, clearly not true, 
it gets rid of all of the constraints on any areas of the budget. So you had a lot of people who took a really fiscally irresponsible vote on a tax cut. You now have a lot of people who join them on a really fiscally irresponsible um, spending increase. And fiscal irresponsibility begets more fiscal irresponsibility. Uh, I would I would just add two brief points. And um, the first is we should keep in mind that you know, your question is about the 2019 budget process. We are not yet done with the 2018 budget process, even uh -huh. though we sort of <laughs> think that we know what it, you know, what um, what it uh, what it looks like. The second is that I think our recent history would suggest that the only reason to expect a budget resolution is if the majority in the House and Senate think that they want to use reconciliation. And I don't know what it is that they would be using reconciliation for, but if there is something that's sort of out there that they think that they're going to want to get through the Senate without having to get uh, any uh, Democratic votes, then that would be a reason. It's not a good reason, but that would be a reason to expect that we might actually end up with a budget resolution passing both houses. Absent that, I think we'll end up with the House passing one, the Senate not passing one, and then, among other things, they'll sort of end up with in different places on appropriations bills, which then just makes the appropriations process more likely to break down than it already was. Let me just make a point on that reconciliation because, um, again, we're a bipartisan organization. Don't I try not to look at things through the lens of Democrat and Republican because I don't think it's a useful way to look at the world. Um, but we, since we have Republicans who have the White House, the Senate, and the House, it is really worth noting that the Republican budgets for many, many years were all structured to demand balance. The goal was we're going to reach balance over 10 or in fact nine years. And that was um, always the case when those budgets were not going to go anywhere, when we knew they weren't actually going to have a big policy effect. And that this past year when we knew that the budget was going to be the guiding document, uh, that the end and the, the result of how many spending cuts were asked for out of the Republican budget that was adopted was zero, what well, one, one billion. Um, out of, again, the need to save about $6 trillion to reach that, that elusive goal of fiscal balance. Um, and then this year, a lot of folks, I spent a lot of time talking to people, so kind of what happened to all the spending cuts that you've been talking about for all these years, and they've just disappeared. Well, we need to focus on tax reform, but we're going to do spending cuts next. So if it were true that the, the goal here were to have uh, a lot of savings through the spending side of the budget, you would insist on reconciliation. Reconciliation is an incredibly powerful tool. It would be how you would get something done this year. And I just think it's very profoundly telling if the decision is not to have reconciliation as part of the budget resolution, that sort of you give up the claim to say that what you want to do is have a lot of savings in whatever parts of the budget. All right, questions? you guys. Dissenting views are welcome as well. Yeah, encouraged. Can you introduce yourself? Yeah, uh, I'm Richard Skinner. I teach at uh, Johns Hopkins University. An awful lot is, uh, Philip mentioned the idea that a lot of schemes to uh, reorient the balance of power on budgeting tends to reorient power towards the executive branch. But right now we have an administration that I can say is maybe less than aggressive in its management of the policy process overall. Uh, what do we do with the budget process where the balance of power swings towards Congress, and is there any way that we can make that work? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to imagine what that, what that looks like. Um, you know, it's, um, you know, I, you know, there, there have been suggestions, for example, when, when Tom Price was chair of the House Budget Committee, um, he actually proposed a budget reform that would have the Congress go first before the President's budget came out. If you, you know, if you gave him truth serum, he would have said, well, he actually said this in public, I don't know why we have a President's budget at all. Once he was appointed Secretary of HHS, he didn't actually have that opinion anymore. And I, and, I, and I think that they sort of had, they were as surprised as everyone else that there wasn't a Democrat elected president. So that, you know, the Congress was sort of preparing when they were having a whole bunch of hearings in the House and Senate on budget process reform, they were sort of preparing for trying to make themselves stronger vis-a-vis -vis the president. But then when they, when, you know, when we ended up with a Republican president, they then, you know, they then sort of, you know, changed their views. So that's the only thing sort of concretely that I have seen, the sort of notion of de-emphasizing the President's budget relative to the budget resolution. Right now, you know, that's not true just because the President goes first. 
Uh, and so, you know, so that's one possibility. Other than that, I, I haven't sort of seen anything um, concrete. I suppose I'm trying to think about super majorities probably wouldn't help because they would just create more sort of possibility of, of, uh, of gridlock. Anything comes to mind strengthening the Congress? I mean, again, most of the most of the ideas, you know, the sort of the notion behind strengthening the president vis-a-vis -vis the Congress is actually a little bit less political, and it's more sort of out of this notion that you should not expect the Congress as a sort of body that has kind of lots of pluralistic interests to be able to act, you know, in a, in a, in the same way that you would expect the sort of president to act. But the notion that presidents are fiscally responsible and the Congress is fiscally irresponsible tends to depend on who the president happens to be at a given point in time. I think the big question, one big question that will get a lot of attention is whether what you want to do is strengthen the majority with the goal being that you actually need somebody who owns the policies and that helps with accountability and then you can determine whether you like the outcomes or not or whether to strengthen the need for bipartisan policy making. Uh, with the argument being that helps with durability after looking at tax cuts and Obamacare and the massive pendulum swinging of putting a policy in place and then spending all your energy trying to get rid of it uh, and seeing that that's not particularly helpful for long-term planning, there'll be different discussions about which it is that you want to strengthen and I think both have, have arguments to them. I, I, I forgot my own personal hobby horse so I want to sort of get it in there which is that I think actually it would be an improvement to the process and probably strengthen the Congress if you made the Budget Committee stronger. Uh, that is, the, the Budget Committees were actually structured to be intentionally weak. Uh, the, you know, the, the sort of people who set up the budget process, the appropriators and the Ways and Means Finance Committee, sort of people who were on the committee that set up the budget process, they didn't want strong budget committees. So what does it mean to have stronger budget committees? I would have budget committees that had, for example, the chairs and ranking members of the important committees in the Congress. Right now there's a bunch of people on the budget committees, especially in the House, who have been in the Congress for an hour and a half. You know, and, um, and so on the one hand, that's the sort of way of using the budget committees as a sort of training ground, you know, for people to kind of understand the budget process. But in the end, the budget committees, I think, would be stronger if they, if they had a little bit more power and if they were coming up with sort of proposals that then had to be implemented by the same people who were sort of making the proposals, which would be the chairs and ranking members of the important fiscal committees. Other questions? Um, I can ask one. Uh, introduce yourself. Uh, Dave Finch, Chairman of the Budget Committee. Um, given uh, that in recent years there's no pension for waiving Cago, uh, I believe we're at around six and a half trillion dollars of Cago waivers over the last 15 years. Um, <laughs> is Cago really a thing anymore? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'll try first. I, I think Pago is a. trying not to cry. I think, <laughs> I think Pago, this is actually a sort of corollary of my point that the budget process is good at enforcing uh, compliance with actions that have already been taken as long as the consensus around those actions sort of holds, right? So, you know, the. I don't know if it was the first time we saw PAYGO wave, but a significant waiver of PAYGO occurred in 2001 with the Bush tax cuts. And so that was a point at which, you know, we, we, those tax cuts by law should have been fully offset. But what they did, as you know, was just to say, well, PAYGO doesn't apply for, you know, to this particular piece of legislation, and then they sort of continued to do that. So, you know, PAYGO, works as an enforcement mechanism to enforce compliance with actions that have already been taken, agreements that have already been reached. But once those agreements break down, uh, then I think PAYGO dies until the next time that you sort of have another similar agreement. So I would try to strengthen it just because I think it's so important. I think it's a fundamental piece of budgeting. And I would just uh, increase the, the, the benchmark that you need to waive PAYGO. It would make it as high as possible, but I don't think you'd get enough people to vote to support that. Um, there is certainly the trick of a lot of these budget process reforms, if we all agree, they'll go into place down the road some amount of time, so people feel like they have a little bit more window of, an ir of being irresponsible. Um, but I think we have to try, or at least 
replace it with something else, but I can't think of something that makes more sense than Pago. I feel like every person who asks a question, just to make it even harder, should have to offer what they think the best budget <laughs> process would be, and then we'll come up with a basket of ideas. So for you two who've already jumped in, if you have them, feel free to weigh in. I do think we should think through the big, biggest improvements. Yeah, like this past time. But it wouldn't be worse. I feel like a lot of times in our office, the way that we guide what we gauge whether we've been successful, we said, well, we made things less worse than they would otherwise have been. Mm -hmm. I don't think increasing it would make PAYGO worse, and we wouldn't make anything worse. There are other hands. Yeah. Uh, um, my name is Molly Reynolds, and I am at Brookings. And I'd just like to hear you um, both react to something that I've noticed about um, the budget process, particularly, particularly quite recently, which is the degree to which part of what seems to be keeping it from functioning is the degree to which it ends up bearing other political conflicts. So the, a great example of this is kind of what just happened with shutdown and DACA and but that's by no means the only example and so how do we think about making the budget process work better when the budget process is sort of the only game in town and so it's being asked to do all sorts of things that it was not necessarily intended to do politically. Yeah, I think that's an excellent question. I also would direct everybody to Molly's really good research and work that's come out of Brookings. A lot of great stuff to see there. Um, I have never worked on the Hill, and so I feel like I suffer as one of those people who looks at the way things are done on the Hill as a completely foreign language. When I read laws, I don't understand <laughs> what they're saying, and when I look at the process for how things are done on the Hill, it seems completely, uh, th this is what's so alienating to a lot of people who aren't involved in all of this. Um, but I just agree with the answer, which is you have to make perif peripheral issues, not peripheral, very important, but issues that aren't the core budgeting, not jump onto the budget piece and mess it up. Because if you can bring in every issue, uh, obviously we're never going to get a budget done. It's hard enough already. So whatever it is that we need to do to make sure that those are considered in different places, that would be an improvement. Well, you probably well, know, well, I, well, I, well, I worked at CBO, which is not quite on the hill. Uh, it's sort of just off the hill. Uh, but uh, I... You know, I guess I would say I think the degree to which this is true because we are so polarized, I think it's, you know, it is true to a greater extent than it used to be. It's not new. You know, it's not new in the sense that it has always been the case that whatever is viewed as a must pass piece of legislation tends to attract lots of other stuff which may be sort of tangentially related to it. I mean, the whole reason we have the bird rule is because of that, because there were things that were being attracted to reconciliation bills that had nothing to do with, uh, with the budget. So if you sort of fix, and I happen to be one of these people that thinks that the budget process is not broken, the political process is broken. Yeah. Um, and so if the political process was such that these things were getting done sort of in regular order, and then people would not believe that the only opportunity to make these things happen was through the budget process. That's, that's not the fault of the budget process. It's the fact that the budget process, because especially appropriation bills, are viewed as you know the only sort of must-pass legislation uh, you know in town. It would they then try, tend to attract whatever it is that anybody else wants to do. Actually, I'd like to ask a question. Um, one thing neither of you touched on in your remarks is something that a lot of people seem to talk about, which is earmarks. A lot of people seem to think, oh, things would work fine if we just could bring earmarks back. I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. They might be an improvement, but I, I completely am at odds with doing that. But it's a different reason than a lot of people. Um, I I would sort of broaden out some of my discontent with the way the overall process works. And this, I think, comes from my world, which is um, being a political independent. And so I'm constantly looking at the rules of Congress and shocked at how much power resides within the majority party leaders. It's not the majority, it's the leaders that throws me off. And so I feel like giving more power to political leaders, doesn't matter which side, and having them call the shots is not consistent with how I think the government should work. 
but a lot of people who understand how you get things done and how you grease the wheels obviously have come to the conclusion it would be more useful to put earmarks back. We don't have an organizational position on it. Uh, so in terms of earmarks, I mean, I would say the nicest thing that, you know, you hear said about earmarks is that they would help to sort of grease the wheels to, you know, to get things done that otherwise might not happen. You know, that's a sort of article of faith. I'm not sure that it's, it's actually true. I do think that earmarks get a bad name in the sense that earmarks sometimes get painted as the sort of, you know, poster child for fiscal irresponsibility, and people then go a step further and say, well, the deficit much, must be larger because we have earmarks. Earmarks are really about who controls the spending. You know, they're not really about whether you have more spending or, or, uh, or, or, less, uh, or less spending. Um, you know, the thing I had not thought of before talking to somebody who uh, was a, one of the clerks on one of the appropriations subcommittees is how much, when there are earmarks, exactly how much time the staff spend on just allocating earmarks. You know, and so in that sense, if you believe that the way the appropriations process should work is that we actually ought to be examining, you know, in some detail what it is that agencies do and sort of performing oversight, if the staff were instead spending their time trying to figure out who gets what earmarks, that to me, you know, is encouraging them to sort of have their their eye off the ball. And so I, I hadn't actually thought about that as a negative consequence of earmarks, but I think it is a negative consequence of earmarks. And I throw in one other negative consequence that I see, which is, it, and you sort of said this, but if so many people are focused on, um, you know, egregious things with ridiculous titles and you can make fun of them and they are very laughable, and I've probably kind of stooped to that cheap line many times because they're so silly, but it does take our eyes off the real focus, which is if you're thinking about the fiscal issues, we can spend more years or more decades avoiding them, but sooner or later we're going to have to figure out how we are going to get our revenues and our spending to be more aligned and acknowledge that in this country there are big disagreements about that and that the answer shouldn't just be we borrow because we don't like, we like to spend a lot, we don't like to pay for it, so we borrow a lot. We're going to have to figure out how to deal with the real drivers of the fiscal challenges. And so I think earmarks are a distraction that makes the public think if you just solve all of those problems, then you don't have to do any of this harder stuff. Well, also, it does not raise public confidence in government. Yeah, you know, that's I mean, that's another important thing. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Phil, uh, question. Um, I have a two part question, sort of two sides of the same thing. One is we spend an awful lot of time in the budget process, a lot of resources around Capitol Hill go into it, even though it sort of seems to be a Preordained failure so much of the time. What what is getting accomplished in that work? Should, should we assume that something of use is still getting accomplished as the people do that work? Second side of the question: What if we just got rid of the budget process? Uh, well, what, tell me, tell us what you mean by that before we answer. <laughs> just get rid of the budget committees. Do do appropriations. Got, okay, all right. Don't don't have congressional budgets, and for having, don't have a presidential budget because that looks like a bunch of wasted paper at this point, too. Where, where would we be if we just got rid of the whole thing? Well, so the second part of that is what you're really saying, if you want to say that, there's no presidential budget, there's no sort of budget committee's budget resolution or something like it, is that nobody is paying attention to the whole budget. You know, at the point at which what you are talking about is is the sort of, a sort of piecemeal approach in the Congress to budgeting, which is we'll pass all these sort of separate pieces of legislation, we'll send them all to the president. You neither have the president focused on kind of what the aggregate budget should look like, sort of overall fiscal policy, nor do you have the Congress focused. That's, to me, that's not a step forward. I completely agree. I think where you'd be, you would have lost the entire big picture. You would have lost all the things that are important about budgeting, which are actually a fraud right now, but at least we're pretending to do them. So I'd rather have the pretend and hope that we slip into doing them in the right way than just give up and focus on the wrong part of the budget, the wrong amount, with no constraints, no trade-offs. And I'm actually going to use your question as an opportunity to express my opinion about biennial budgeting. <laughs> Um, which is because I do think the goal of many people who support a biennial budget, there, there are sort of two goals, one of which I think is very admirable and the second of which I think is sort of less admirable. The less admirable one is we spend too much time on budgeting. Well, I mean, we're a $4 trillion enterprise. We ought to spend some time on budgeting. Um, the, the, the sort of 
more sort of laudable goal is that if we have a biennial budget, it will create more predictability in terms of you know, the appropriations process, for example, because agencies will have a clearer idea over more years sort of how much money they're going to get. That one I have some sympathy for uh, if it actually happened. And, you know, but I think you would have to believe that the appropriations committees are going to sort of do what the biennial budgeting bills say they would do, which is to take every other year off. You know, so the sort of notion here is that we'd have a year of budgeting and then a year of oversight. Uh, and But if you had big supplementals in the so-called non-budget year, then it would begin to look like the budget year. And especially in the House, where appropriations is an exclusive assignment, you're basically asking very powerful members of Congress to just sort of not do anything for, you know, every other year. In terms of oversight, I don't think the reason oversight is not done better has to do with uh, the fact that there's not time to do it. I think there are not really incentives to do sort of effective oversight. People don't get elected or fail to get elected because of the way that they are uh, holding the executive branch accountable, except in these sort of silly, high-profile Benghazi type, you know, sort of things. And we could think of, you know, examples on, on the other side where it's really just a way of, uh, of getting headlines. It's not a way of actually making sure that the government operates better. Yeah. Uh, Daniel Schumer, with the man. I was going to, I was going to. Okay, sure. <laughs> uh, so, so, oh, I'm Vernon Baker. I work for a congressman here. Um, Sorry, you work for Congressman? Uh, Mike Thompson. Okay. To, to, I guess, be a little bit of a Naismith on the process reform side, uh, is it possible that the problems that exist really have relatively little to do with the process and more to do with kind of fundamental things like I guess in my mind, I think the fact that Congress or a Congress doesn't have any real ability to bind itself, let alone a future Congress, to, to basically anything. And attempts to do so, like PAYGO, are quite, you know, it's a good idea, but as we've seen, altering PAYGO scorecard is a nothing thing that we do now. Uh, it doesn't rile anybody up. And I think um, possibly the other thing is that the actual revealed preferences of voters don't suggest they have any appetite or more physical discipline. I am not a campaign guy, but I uh, I don't think that it is likely a campaign of I'm going to spend less on your priorities and raise taxes is going to get a lot of people elected, right? And I think people, I think voters, in fact, tend to respond quite well to I will spend more on your preferences and lower your taxes, right? I think that's generally how these, these things play out. And so uh, regardless of kind of what the process looks like, as long as those two things are the case, uh, is it just possible the process that in some sense no process is going to address those issues? So it's a great point, and it's a it's a concept I've been giving a ton of thought to recently because I think the fiscal issues and the national debt, which is something that I sort of built my whole professional life worrying about, but I just don't think it's the biggest problem anymore. I think it is a reflection of the bigger problems, which is that we have a governance system that no longer is functioning. And it doesn't function in so many ways, but a couple of them related to the budget are that we no longer um, focus on public goods, things that are non-rival, non-visible, things that only government can do. It's a lot easier to focus on things that people feel the direct benefit of, and they're, they're psyched because they have big tax breaks, they have big spending programs, and it's quite the opposite of a traditional public good. And it's the same thing that leads us to be very short-term focused instead of long-term focused. So no, I don't think fixing the budget process will fix those problems. I don't even think fixing the fiscal situation will improve this overall governance situation well enough that we should be happy um, or, or sort of pacify the things are on the right track. But I still do think it could be worth it. First, I think the, very, the point about one Congress cannot bind the future Congress is absolutely right, and that's why dealing with long-term budgeting is so challenging. But PAYGO actually is the opposite of that. It's this Congress, it's a Congress binding itself. And that's why I think there's something that's really smart about it, saying we can't make a decision where we're not willing to accept that you have to make the trade-off to get us to that decision. So that's why I think that simple concept is so powerful. Um, and again, I do think there are a lot of people who are very worried about the issues in terms of that we can't budget, that we can't make these decisions, but they feel 
not empowered to do it. So there are a lot of members of Congress who feel like if their leaders don't want to do it, there's very little power that they have in making these changes. So if you strengthen the rules, in some ways that can take away, that can put the power of going through this decision making, which a lot of people think would be the right thing. Um, so I think there's a chance for it working. Finally, on the fiscal issue, there's no question that fiscal responsibility is never going to be something that bubbles up from the bottom. It's not going to be a grassroots issue. We're, there are a lot of grassroots issues. We're seeing a lot of them right now. Critically important, but you have to understand them. Nobody's going to understand fiscal responsibility. Nobody can even understand trillions. Like, it makes sense to none of us. So what you need is uh, representatives who you actually trust when they're talking about these issues. And right now, pretty much across the board, but certainly starting at the top, we have our political leaders who are saying, don't worry about this. We can cut taxes, we'll grow our way out of it. We can increase spending, and for some reason that doesn't matter either. Like, nobody is actually talking about why fiscal, fiscal short-term decisions are bad for the long-term good of the country. But we've seen that when you do have those leaders, and particularly when it's bipartisan, so people say, well, if both those people can just agree on this, there must be something to it, then the public supports it a lot. So this is just an issue where the public supports or follows its leaders they don't lead their leaders on it. So it's going to take political leaders who come back and talk about the issues and say, listen, we might disagree on how we're going to fix it, but we do think we have to acknowledge that we have to do A, B, and C, these things, and then I'm pretty sure the public sentiment will come back to thinking it's the thing we have to do. Um, but I would agree, I must be the only person who goes and literally tries to figure out who would raise my taxes the most and cut my spending the most and vote that way. And anyone who follows that any politician who follows that advice is probably going to lose their seat right now, and that's one of the biggest strategic challenges there is to all of this. So uh, I can't believe it. it's 107, and this is the first time that I have quoted this, but uh, so there's a famous quote from Rudy Penner, who was know, used, to be, used to be director of the Congressional Budget Office, and the quote is, the process is not the problem, the problem is the problem. And, you know, and so, you know, no process reform is going to sort of make us confront the, the problem if we're not sort of willing to do it. Having said that, um, you know, Herb Stein, who uh, was uh, a, uh, you know, the chair of the Council on Economic uh, Advisors, I think, in the Nixon administration, and, uh, you know, so he wrote this, this sort of interesting little book that's called Governing the Five Trillion Dollar Economy, which tells you how long ago it was written. Uh, but, uh, you know, he said in there, there are sort of two things that can kind of lead to better fiscal outcomes, better people and better information. And he said, since I don't know how to get better people, and since nobody knows how to get better people, budget process reforms have always been focused on information. And so I think to focus on, you know, how it is that we can provide the information that will make more transparent what the effect of choices would be, I think that's a very important thing. And my sort of cautionary note at this point, and I will at this point sort of explicitly defend CBO, uh, but other organizations like that is that I think we are uh, in a time which I think is a sort of dangerous time uh, where uh, not only is there a, a general attack on the idea that there can be objective fact or you know objective analysis, if not objective fact, of course predictions of the future are wrong. The question is are they biased or, or are they not biased? But if, we're not, if we not only question you know, the idea of objective analysis, but we then openly attack the institutions that are attempting to provide that objective analysis, it's not going to get us where it is that we need to know. And from the standpoint of just thinking about the Congress, if we're all sort of sitting here in, in the room and we're thinking about how it is that we can make the Congress more effective, more functional, even you know, powerful vis-a-vis -vis the executive branch, uh, you know, criticizing and sort of defanging the institutions that are that the Congress has in order to provide itself with its own analytical capacity seems very <laughs> short-sighted. Just because, and you're and you're doing it just because you didn't like the score that you got on one particular piece of legislation. So I'll get off my soapbox now. Okay. So I'm Daniel Schneider, and that your point that was actually exactly. Sorry, where are you from? Demand progress. Uh, so that's exactly the sort of where I wanted to go. I, the question that I had has to do with information and understanding gaps uh, inside the institution itself. You've seen as you just described tax on CBO, uh, you see changes in the way st appropriations are staffed. For example, there used to be staff designees for uh, uh, 
all members of the Appropriations Committee now, only senior members of the Appropriations Committee that are that are grandfathered and can have their own staffer that, that supports them. Uh, so the question that I have for you is, you know, and, and this has been part of a broader trend uh, Congress-wide in terms of decreasing the number of staff, undermining the support offices and the support agencies and so on. Uh, what, in your opinion, can be done both to increase the, sorry, let me do this one. Is there enough information that's already available to members and to their staff, since the staff do the vast majority of the work here, to understand what's going on? And do and are the people there? Are they sufficiently like we've talked about a bunch of a, a number of like complex concepts? And as you go further down into budget, it gets even more complex. Are there people there who have sufficient understanding of this to be able to advise uh, the members? And if not, um, uh, is it a resource problem? Is it some other kind of problem? So can you sort of spell out the scope of that just a little bit more, and you know, where you think it might be? Really important question, um, which I, I agree with sort of the point that you're making on that. What I saw a lot in the past two debate, I mean, I'm, I'm still just bearing the frustration and the scars of both the spending bill and the tax bill that we saw, but so much of it, when we met with tons of staffers, first, there was not the institutional knowledge at the staff level that there was in the past. There was certainly more turnover. Many pe Most people have not experienced reconciliation. There's so many, well, the most recent one before that. One. There's so many um, people who have not gone through the years and years of budgeting and have the kind of build up of knowledge that we used to have. But what I've been really disheartened to see is that how many staff had to depend on information that came from the leaders of their parties and came through an incredible political lens. And when you're dealing with revamping the entire tax code, for instance, and the spending bill is, is a, a parallel but not as complicated thing to look at, that is where you need absolutely critical, unbiased, important information. You get all the political talking points as well, but I was really disheartened to see how many people believed the things that I will, it's not wrong to say they were just absolutely made up numbers that were in this tax bill. And a lot of staffers did not have access to good quality analysis and understanding. I mean, if you're trying to pull apart the dynamic models of various organizations, it's not an easy thing to do. Um, so one specific thing I would do, and you can tell I'm kind of on this new frustrated, um, focus of that leaders have too much power and senior members have too much power. I didn't know that about appropriations, but I don't think in democracy one member should be more staff than another, depending on where they are. I mean, if you're on a committee, that's different. But I think junior members should have just as much access to good information as senior members, as members of leadership. And so for me, again, it comes from not being in a political party and not wanting to see this consolidation of power at the top of the two parties, which are busy warring at each other instead of trying to solve problems. But I think staffing where people have access to just as good information is really important. I also know that we in the past have set up kind of, uh, think like we try to be a resource to anybody who tries to learn more about the budget. We have 10 people in our policy shop and so members who want to work on something will come to us, we'll try to give them information like that, but we're tiny. We need to have more of that available where members actually have places where they can go and learn not from the political lens, but the policy lens, the answer to a bunch of these questions and make this more like a policy exercise <coughs> than a political exercise. So I, I think it comes down to budgeting and resources tremendously. Um, I, I would only say one thing, which is that, you know, which I agree with everything that Maya just said, but I would say it is not a supply problem, it's a demand problem. You know, I think that the I think that the information that's out there, I think there's more information than there ever has been. I think in a sense there might even be too much information because there are credible sources you know, that don't agree on sort of various things, and so you sort of, you know, pick and choose in a sense sort of which numbers you want to use, but I think the biggest issue is that there may not be the demand for what I will call objective analysis and maybe objectives in the eye of the beholder, but I think we kind of know at least what the range of sort of objective estimates look like. And I think, you know, if people want to get that information, there are places to, to get it. I think it's the want that may be missing. Is, is the lack of demand because of partisanship or just because staffers don't, are, are so overwhelmed that they don't even know, they have the experience or time to, to figure out what they should be asking? Well, my own view is it's because of partisanship. It's because, it's because of the uh, it's because of the echo chamber that people live in where there are particular sources of information that are viewed by one side or the other as credible because they, get, they provide the answer 
the preconceived, the answer that you already sort of knew, but you were looking for ammunition. I, I wouldn't even call it data. I would call it ammunition. Yeah, there's no reward for disagreeing with your party on some of these big issues right now, so I think it's a reflection of both. <coughs> Logan Freeman from Jerry Hoffman. I'm curious though, when talking about not wanting to empower party leaders and senior members, one of the other earlier ideas was also discussing empowering the budget committee, right. which would in effect be an extension of empowering empowering leadership, especially if you're stacking it with chairs and ranking members. And I'm curious from do we have this idealistic goal that every single member should be equal in a military democracy and you know have their say in the process versus, you know, from an international perspective, we have terms like back ventures because some people just don't matter as much in the legislative position than others. And wouldn't a more centralized process of experts, of members that know what they're doing, lead to results where, you know, we make things on time, whereas if you empower every individual member, you, you know, maybe you're trying to hit a midnight deadline and one member can mess things up more here until 4 a.m. <laughs> yeah, so again, this is sort of out of my lane. This is this is not fiscal policy, but my feeling is um, I'd rather go for that egalitarian one, not for lack of respect for expertise, but because of the belief that it isn't about expertise where this power is being consolidated. It's about furthering the power of that political party. I think that you have the leaders of both political parties in Congress caring more about increasing their majority or regaining their majority than they do uh, bringing that expertise to bear. So I certainly think empowering the budget committee makes a ton of sense because that's who you've designated to make the budget decisions. But I think a junior member should have just as much say as a senior member. I I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm quite in the same place. I mean, you know, call me an elitist, but I, you know, I think that there is a world in which, you know, perhaps if you have empowered, you know, people with more seniority and more expertise, you might actually end up with better outcomes. But you know, that all depends on sort of who the senior leaders are and kind of what their goals are. Yeah, no, elitist. Um, no. <laughs> I totally agree with you. I just think that those folks who have more expertise can win people over by sharing the expertise instead of having more power in the process. But I may be very wrong on this. I, I'm, I'm thinking out loud. The gentleman in the corner has been patiently waiting. Yeah. Go ahead. So ten, 10 years is a really tough issue because I think we have no problem in the short term and I think we definitely have the problem in the long term and we don't know exactly what that looks like. And the question is when does short become long? So 10 years is medium term. The biggest question is what would be going on in other countries, whether we have a real problem or not. My guess is we don't have a real problem in terms of external markets. I don't know what's going to happen when interest rates go up. That's a big issue, right? And we know that, that in all likelihood we're going to start to feel that. We do know that because we have so much borrowing and rates have been low for so long, and our interest payments are relatively low right now, it's going to be a bit of a shock to see just how uh, structurally dependent we are on borrowing and vulnerable we are to rate increases. So that's not good. It pushes out other parts of the budget. It's not a great place to be putting our resources on interest payments when there's so many other important things we should be putting them on. But I think the most likely scenario is sort of the most discouraging one, which is we will be muddling along. And what that means is that our economy will be harmed by the higher level of debt, but not in a way that's transparent enough that we can say, oh my gosh, this is because we borrowed so much for so long. And we already are dealing with very low growth numbers for the next 10 years. Probably be pretty high, meaning almost 3% in the next year and a half or two, because we just overstimulated the economy and we're going to have a big sugar boost. We're going to hear a lot about, see, this is so great, the tax cuts are growing the economy. This is short term. But because we have these demographic issues and baby boomers are moving into retirement, our labor market is not growing the way it used to, our growth is going to be much lower than it would have otherwise been. Higher levels of debt mean that's going to be even lower and it's harder to break through. What this country should be doing is putting forth a really thoughtful, comprehensive economic growth program. And that has to do with a lot of different policies. It would have been revenue neutral or even revenue enhancing tax reform that was much more pro-growth efficient, making us competitive smart regulatory reform, more public investments and things that will bear long-term growth, um, a lot of different policies that will all do small amounts to help grow the economy. 
but one of the best things that you can do in that same area is bring your debt levels down. That will help with promoting growth. So my concern is that 10 years from now, our growth will be pretty stagnant. This country that already has the kinds of tensions I haven't seen you know, before and are really scary and feel like they're pulling people apart instead of bringing them together are going to be worse with an economic pie that's not growing as fast as it should be. And I think it's just going to be this ongoing feeling of things aren't what they should be, but there's nothing directly to point at it. And so to, to do my quote of great um, budget type people, they're just like four quotes that we all say at every one of these <laughs> meetings. But Charlie Schultz, who was a great economist for many, many years at Brookings, uh, used to always say that deficit was like termites in the basement. And that really is exactly like what it is. That to, over time, slowly, it is just eating away at the foundation of the economy. And you won't really know that it's happening. We may never realize what it was, but it is going to have dampening effects on everything else that we could be doing. And I would just add, this is at a moment that's so critical for this economy, where with globalization and technology and the changing nature of work, there are so many things that we should be doing with the government working uh, with an economy with tons of potential, but also tons of risks and tons of change, so that we could be smartly thinking about how to take advantage of all these opportunities instead of the big risks that they also present getting the better of us. And we just tied our hands so that we aren't going to have the resources to deal with lifelong worker training, all kinds of retraining, just all the different things that we need to be doing to tackle the changing nature of the economy. Um, that, I think, will be the biggest lost opportunity that we didn't come to this huge challenge of the next couple decades nearly as prepared as we could and should have been. Just to show you the extent to which we all use the same quotes, the only thing I was going to add was the Charlie Schultz quote. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask, before, before we uh, break up for the day, our, our two experts, we had this recent experiment, I guess it started around 2012 or so, with statutory budget caps. And it goes back to the very smart question about self-binding. Uh, and making it more difficult to do things that might be uh, might be the easy choices. How do you read our experiment with the caps? Was there any positive out of it? Did it have no effect on fiscal behavior, spending behavior, negative effects? So I would say, I mean, the first two times we replaced the caps with the first time was changes that had a lot of users' fees and revenues that were not called revenues and some changes to mandatory spending. But then the best one that we had that part, was part of that budget deal we repealed within one or two months, including the people who had put together the deal, Ryan Murray. Um, and so it showed that you could have kind of something that would force you to make some hard choices, not enough, but some to offset it when we lift the caps. The next time we looked at the caps, we had more gimmicks. This time we didn't even bother to offset it. So I think the caps have probably outlived their usefulness. But the main lesson I would take, um, and but they are the things that generated the most savings in the budget over the past years. I would just say they were stupid savings instead of the smart savings we should be looking at. The lesson I've learned is back to you could have good triggers or bad triggers. I think it's time for this country to have triggers that would be smart policy. So if we're not going to act on things, you'd need to put in place automatic changes on both sides of the budget, revenues and mandatory savings that are ones that you could live with, not that what are ones that are so stupid you assume we won't live with them and then okay. find out that we might. I, I would just go back to caps that worked. In the early 1990s, we had caps on discretionary spending that actually worked. But the reason that they worked is because sort of serendipitously, uh, the Soviet Union collapsed uh, at the same time that we had imposed those caps. And so a lot of those, the savings, came out of the defense budget. And th these caps, you know, they were sort of at a different time uh, in our history. Uh, but the other thing that those caps sort of fell prey to was uh, affluence in the sense that we actually got to a place by fiscal year 1998 where we had budget surpluses, believe it or not. And so having caps on discretionary spending and budget surpluses simultaneously was kind of the equivalent of asking the budget process to walk and chew gum at the same time. Uh, and so, you know, at that point, people sort of gave up on the caps and they gave up on Pago. Uh, you know, so that's sort of back to, you know, if you've got a goal uh, and the budget process is sort of helping you achieve that goal and, and consensus remains on the goal, then I think there's lots of reforms that work. But, you know, this is an example where we didn't ever really agree on the goal. You know, we agreed that we were going to put things in place that were going to force us to do something later on, but we really didn't want to do them. Ready one final question? Yeah, one more out there. Uh, thanks. Uh, I'm Ken Ford, I'm an independent consultant, and uh, I want to come back to the underlying political will. She was so kind of foundational, and we haven't talked about all that much. Um, and I guess I want to push back a little bit on, on the um, 
assertion that it's that this can't be a grassroots issue. Uh, and I, you know, budgeting is complicated, and all the lot of the stuff we've talked about today is complicated. But people get, I think, the same way that like the climate is complicated, people get that rising sea levels are bad. It's the same way that people get responsibility and get that a rising national debt is bad, even if they can't kind of point out when it's like, too bad. Um, and it seems to me the Republican Party was was doing this, like they were mobilizing that sense of progressive level for a while and they kind of gave up on that uh, recently. But um, I guess to, to turn into a question, is anyone out there around the country working to mobilize that in a bipartisan way? Yeah, we have a coalition that's working on it, the Campaign to Fix the Debt, which has state chapters, which is totally bipartisan, trying to do that. And then, but the truth is, for the past couple of years, I kind of kept it quiet because there's nobody to encourage to do anything. Like, in order to have grassroots, you need to tell them who, first, if your grassroots are asking their members of Congress to do something hard, raise our taxes and or cut our spending, and this coalition is based on both you're gonna be like one call to every million that's against those. And that's okay, we knew that. The reason we built this coalition is for there to be a group of people who would at least say, we actually want you to make those hard choices. But I think it kind of needs to be in tandem where there's somebody who you can say, this is what we want. And right now there seems to be, like bipartisanship means we will both trade what we want and not paying for it. So that, that that's, you know, the bipartisan agreement is I get what I want, I don't pay, you get what you want, you don't pay. So. What I don't know, and if you really think it's possible, I am so open to any ideas, how you jump start it starting at the grassroots. I think they have to work in tandem, but I don't think it starts anywhere other than the top. And when I think about it strategically, I don't think it starts anywhere other than the 2020 presidential election with somebody coming and talking about this issue only because the deficit's so huge, all the other candidates wishing they wouldn't talk about it, but the public buying into it enough that they push more of a discussion so that we start to have that discussion. Like, are you saying Ross Perot? Yes. Yeah, yeah it's, like, it's like Ross Perot Jr. Um, but if there are other ways that, I mean, I spend time going to the states, I talk to people, they do totally get it, but then they say, what am I supposed to do about it? And this is not a thing where you're going to call, enough people are going to call their members of Congress or put op-eds out and say, please raise my taxes and please reform these entitlement programs that you're going to get momentum coming from there. But I don't want to be a downer, because if there's a way to do it, I, and it has to be bipartisan, I think it's really important. And I, I would just say, besides Maya's organization, you know, there are at least two other organizations out there that really care about this and have had some focus at the grassroots level. One is the Concord, Concord Coalition, Coalition, and the second is the Peterson uh, Foundation, which is, you know, sort of headquartered in New York. And, you know, so both of those organizations, I think if they, all three of these organizations, if they thought the sort of time was right, you know, they would focus on the on the grassroots. I think the question really is, you know, what's the what's the right time, or do you try to sort of build uh, at least public education now? You yeah. know, so that so that when the sort of moon and the stars align, you have a more you know sort of educated population. You know, my organization. You know, used to go out. I don't know if they still do. They used to they go do. out, and, you know, to have actual sort of groups of citizens kind of sit around and do the we you balance the budget the debt exercise. fixer. Anybody who would like to run the debt fixer in their district or right. online Friday night alone. It's really <laughs> fun. I, I did when, before before Maya's time when the when the previous uh, president was the, when I was still at CBO and the previous president of the. Uh, uh, Committee for Responsible Federal Budget. Uh, I went to uh, Grand Forks, North Dakota, nice. and the Mall of America to run, you know, these sort of exercises. Exercise in hard choices. Uh, yeah, yeah, these exercises in hard choices, and it was quite, you know, sort of telling. And I think there have been surveys that have been done that suggest exactly, uh, you know, what has been suggested here earlier, which is that the the public is actually at some level more willing to do some of these things, meaning raising taxes and cutting entitlements than the average m member of Congress might be. I think I don't want to get too far into a political debate because it's way out of my, uh, you know, way out of my lane, but I mean, I think there's some question with sort of redistricting and sort of other things, the extent to which the Congress is a truly representative body uh, at this point. Do th that is, to what extent does the Congress actually represent the will of the people as opposed to, you know, being sort of very uh, polarized, more polarized than the public is? 
Well, with that, <laughs> yes. Next time is Congress representative. <laughs> uh, well, thank you. Yep. Thank you guys. That was yep. awesome. Great. Thanks. Thank Thanks, you guys everyone. for going up.